you have a good pass? Yeah! yeah. All right, so I'm really excited about what we're going to do here today. Um, as far as I know, we have never had a sitting member of Congress come and talk at PACS. I know that we've had local politicians here, as they get on the news for like walking around the show floor, but I don't think they've ever actually engaged with the PACS audience. So I am really excited that we are getting something important. I'm going to tell you all the stuff she's done a little bit. Um, And while the enthusiasm is great, clap quick and stop, because we don't have a ton of time. So I know that it can feel, well first, we're living in really significant times, you guys. You know how in the history books, there are the decades that get like a paragraph, and the decades that get like a chapter? We're in one of the decades that's gonna get a chapter. And regardless of where you sit on the political spectrum, it's important to be involved right now, because there are no uninvolved bystanders at this point. Even if you're not affected by you know, the legislation about immigrants, you're affected by what they do with your health care. And not to be alarmist, but if we end up in a nuclear war, we're all affected. It's time to get involved. If not now, I don't, like, I don't know what it takes to get involved. But I do know that it can feel like the political process and the government is this giant faceless machine. And it's like, you know, what can one person do? Well, this is all happening because I went out to dinner with a friend who uh, happened to have worked with the congresswoman's campaign before, and I was like, you know, everybody criticizes gamers for being politically apathetic and uninvolved, but like, the government hasn't done a whole lot of reaching out to gamers, right? Like, it seems the only time they're interested in us is when it's like, oh, do video games cause violence? Or, you know, they're trying to take away our broadband or something like that. So. I was like, can we get everybody in the room and talk about the issues that are important? And it turns out, you know, one, pe one person, me, became two people. My friend and I became reaching out to uh, the congresswoman's campaign and getting a lot of people involved, and now we're here. So you can do something. Hey. So I'm going to look at my phone just because I don't want to forget any uh, of the, uh, don't want to forget to mention anything important about either of these two people. But, uh, so, I'd like to welcome Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal. Uh, she is the senior whip of the Democratic House Caucus, the vice ranking member of the House Budget Committee. She's a member of the Judiciary Committee, the Subcommittee on Immigration, the Subcommittee on Regulatory Reform, Commercial and Antitrust Law. I know that's a lot of formal sounding stuff, but like, that's the stuff we're interested in. Those are the committees that make the laws and access. No, Mike. <laughs> um, he is founder of Lone Shark Games. He's the designer of your favorite games such as Thornwatch, the Pathfinder Adventure card game, and Apocrypha. Uh, he's also politically involved. He's the one who started the Ghastly Trump Tinies. I don't know if you saw that satire. Um, and united a bunch of game developers under the Gamers for Her hashtag and banner. Um, oh, and he runs a little conference called Pax Dev. Uh, oh, and you told me I had to tell you who I was, so. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm Jessica Price. I work with the narrative team at ArenaNet on Guild Wars 2. Prior to that, I was at Paizo making Pathfinder role-playing game, which is how Mike and I started working together, and I'm on the curation committee for PaxDev. And now, because I'm the least interesting person on the stage, <laughs> I'm going to let these two take it away. I swear I wasn't going to forget this. If you still have questions, write them on a card and hold them up, and I will come around and collect them. Awesome. Thank you, Jessica. Hi. Hi. So what's your favorite Street Fighter game? <laughs> no, we're not doing that here. We're going we're gonna to talk about like actual stuff that matters, um, at least to me. Hopefully it matters to you guys, too. Uh, thanks for coming. I'm really happy to be here. And I can't believe I'm the first sitting Congress member to come and talk to PAX West. Yeah. How awesome is that? <laughs> to be fair, we're only 100,000 people, so we can't be that interesting <laughs> to, to a politician. <laughs> um, well, I have a lot of questions for you. And uh, so I'd like to ask them if that's okay. Yeah, before you do, yeah, can yeah, I say why I'm here and why yeah. I thought this was so important? That was question one, actually. <laughs> okay, good. Well, there you go. So um, for those of you who don't know me, I am really proud to represent this district in the United States Congress. 
And, you know, everybody says that they represent the best district in Congress, but I actually do represent yeah. the best district in Congress. Um, and I'm also the first Indian American woman to be in the House of Representatives. And I'm the first woman to represent this district and the first person of color in the Democratic delegation ever in, the, in uh, Washington State. So, so that's only important because um, I really believe that that is the way you get the best ideas. And the reason I wanted to come here is because I can't believe that there is a community this large and this big of an industry, $20 billion in the United States, $100 billion in the world, with such a huge community, and I'm an organizer, I'm a community organizer. I came to politics through organizing, through fighting for immigrant civil and human rights and worker rights. I was on the $15 minimum wage committee. I've done all this stuff outside of elected office, but in the political system. And when I think about what matters to me, it's about creating communities that have innovation, that have creativity, that have a lot of diversity, and that's what I feel like this community is about. And so um, I'm new to gaming, so that's why he was joking about asking me about you know, all these gaming questions. You're gonna teach me about that, but what I really wanna do is figure out how we use the incredibly powerful voice that you have as a community so you have your individual voice, but you also have this enormous voice as a community, and we need it. Jessica's totally right that we are at this crossroads on so many levels, on so many issues, really on the soul of our country, and we desperately need your involvement. And so part of my very selfish interest is in being here is how do we game the resistance? That's what I do in Congress, is try to help lead the resistance to a lot of the horrible things that are happening, but not only as an opposition party or an opposition agenda, but also as a proposition party, right? We can't just say what we're against, let's also say what we're for. So for me, and we're gonna talk about all these things, I'm sure, but it means college for all. It means getting rid of college debt for people across this country. It means a single payer healthcare system. Yeah. It means... It means net neutrality. It means making sure that we are protecting free speech and the internet and what the environment that you all work in is at the core of that. So we're gonna get to all of this, I know, but I just wanna say thank you for allowing me to come here. Um, thank you, Jessica, for getting the conversation started. Thank you, Mike, for um, being this wonderful mix of gaming and politics, because I really think politics is part of every environment. And if you don't use your voice and take up that space, somebody else will take it. So it's either you or it goes to somebody else and you give it away. And they may not have the same interest that you do. So anyway, thanks for having me here. I can't wait to hear your, your questions and just have a conversation about how we take back our country and how we make sure that we really protect community whether it's in the online community or whether it's in our physical communities, how we protect community, diversity, innovation, creativity, and really love and generosity. Thanks. Well, I don't have anything else. <laughs> uh, okay, I do have something else. Um, I have a number of things, and uh, I like all those words you said. Uh, most of those words you said. We can talk about specifics, but the, um, one of the things that I think is on a lot of people's mind here is that uh, in the, the last election and, and going into this year, the mainstream media and, the, and quite possibly the Democratic Party was quite surprised by the existence of all these neo-Nazis that came out of the woodwork, that just, just magically materialized to rally behind flipping the table and, uh, and getting their guy into the White House. Uh, we weren't surprised by that. We knew, that we, we, we knew that they were there because we had seen our forums, our, our, uh, our, our portals, every, everything that we use filled with some of the worst people in the history of the United States. And it didn't hurt that the, uh, one of the people going into the White House was a gold farmer from the world of Warcraft named Steve Bannon, who, uh, who now, and thankfully gone, but still has a massive influence on politics. 
what do we do about this? Like, I want to keep free speech and all, but what do we do about this group of people? Well, I wasn't surprised either because I told you I spent the last 20 years of my life fighting for immigrant civil and human rights. And so um, from right after 9-11 when I started what is now One America, the largest immigrant advocacy organization in the state, and we were fighting back against Islamophobia at the time, um, and that very quickly morphed into immigrant rights more broadly. And I, you know, I get enormous hate mail directed at me, have for a sure. long time. Death no threats, doubt. lynching threats, everything, just because I'm standing up for constitutional and civil rights and for humanity. Um, I think what is so different now is there was at least a semblance of the highest officials of the land um, standing up and speaking out. Though I will say, right after 9-11, there are a lot of people who did not want to stand with sure. me in Absolutely. front of a mosque which has changed now, thanks to the organizing work of probably a lot of people in this room and across the country and across our state. Um, but now we have this presidentially sanctioned white supremacy and hate. That's what's happening now. And so um, it's not a question of whether we're surprised by it or not. It's a question of how we respond. So I introduced a resolution right after Charlottesville to get rid of Steve Bannon and um, all the white supremacists in the White House. Now we've gotten rid of two of them. We still have one, one more to go. go. One to go. Um, and then, of course, we have the president himself. Yeah. And so then I introduced a censure resolution, along with my colleagues Bonnie Watson Coleman and Jerry Nadler, to censure the president for his um, behavior and actions and to actually come out publicly against white supremacy. And you know. It really bothers me that there are a lot of Republicans who have started to say on Twitter in 140 characters that they don't condone what he's doing, but the fact that not a single one has signed on to the resolution, which now has 117 co-sponsors, all Democrats, um, on it, I think is a huge problem because we have got to, just like you have to have rules and norms within your online community, we have those within um, our physical community here, legislation is a backstop to make sure that if those norms and rules aren't followed, that there's a consequence. And I really do believe that now you can't, in Europe, for example, um, they have a very different view of free speech in that if you do the Nazi salute mm -hmm. or you say Heil Hitler or you, you know, any of those things, that is a crime. And we do have to think about in the United States how we make sure that there is real accountability for free speech for all. Because when you say free speech, but it's dominated by white supremacists who make threats or put nooses outside an African American museum, as just happened in Washington, DC, who is it really free for? Is it free for everybody or just for some who control the conversation. So it's a tricky issue. I don't know exactly wh where you draw the lines, but I do think that what we're seeing now is a need for us as individuals, as a community, and as elected officials, and as the President of the United States to really come out very strongly against all of this. and and then, of course, put legislative means in place to strengthen hate crimes laws, to strengthen um, regulation for the online community, which you have to help figure out what that really looks like. Sure. Um, I mean, that's, that's, th that's the problem with free speech. Uh, and that's certainly the one that we've hit head on. There are companies now in the gaming industry that, that right up front say, if you're going to do this stuff in our forums, you will be gone. And there yeah. are companies, importantly, that do not. Yes. That they specifically do not want to enter into this conversation because they think the community completes themselves. Do you think the community completes itself? I, I don't. I think that we really need a combination of the community, the people who are engaged in the community, the developers, if we're talking in this context. Sure, but, but I mean everywhere. Context, Every, all really, them, any yeah, context. Yeah. Every level of society has to be a part of policing. And you do have, policing in this sense, yeah. right? You it's do legit. have to have some accountability. Now, sometimes it can come from the community. Um, you know, if, if a community decides, for example, consumers who decide that they're not gonna 
frequent a particular company sure. because of what they're doing, that is a form of policing. Let's just be really clear about that. So it's not always that you have to have legislation that provides that accountability, but we've all got to take those steps to really be a part of that accountability process. Um, for years, people, you know, would would uh, laugh at, at racist jokes in front of me, or they'd say, "You're not, you're not like all those other, you know, brown people, immigrants, whatever." Fill in the word, and I would just have to call it out. Right? Sure. You have to because you can't just stand by when that's happening and then say, well, it's not really my job. It is our job every single minute to try to make the society what we want it to be. And there's different levels of that. Let's talk about your job. Um, so uh, we would say that 2016, we had a pretty high watermark for uh, women's rights, for gay rights, for voting rights, for abortion rights all that. We don't seem to be at that high water mark anymore. Are we going to get back through congressional, through political action, to the environment that we had in the Obama administration that may well have caused some of the uprising against, uh, against the gains that, that people made? Uh, or are we just going to settle back into where we were years ago? I'm an organizer, and you have to be an optimist to be an organizer, sure. so I definitely don't think that we're settling back into anything. Um, if anything, I think that this has showed us what's at stake, and the thing that gives me the most hope is that the resistance is alive and well, and that we are now seeing people engage in a way that they never did before. I mean, who would have thought that the word emoluments would be sure. so popular, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. I mean, all uh, of a did sudden. You know, did you know what the text of the 25th <laughs> Amendment was? All of a sudden, I was, everybody's I was talking quite about what is the <laughs> mental state of the president, and how do we, yeah. you know, right? So, I mean, that's an opportunity for us to say, okay, this is what democracy really is. And, um, and so, I do think that this is a really, really difficult time. There's just no two ways about it. We are at a low point. Every day I look at something new that's happening and I'm not surprised. Yeah, right. Which is really scary. Yeah, that's, that's the, right? like you wake up, you look, at the, you look at the news and go, well, I guess that's gone. Right. And so then, the, but the question really is, so how do we mount the same kind of defense that so many people have had to do for generations sure. before us and fighting for all those rights. How do we mount that same or more intense defense of what we hold so dear? And so that's, I think that's a stage we're in. Um, we're definitely at an increasingly low point on a lot of levels in terms of issues, but we're at a high point in terms of the potential for engagement. And that's why like this community is so important, right? We have the opportunity to really shift how people see their participation and their ability to change the future. Sure. Um, let's talk about something this community likes a lot, which is science. We're, uh, we're kind of nerds, and uh, <laughs> might, maybe a little. And uh, how many of you put an exclamation point when I said the word science? Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, um, climate change banned from the White House website. Uh, the president is an anti-vaxxer. Uh, what, what do we do to get science back? <laughs> it is so ludicrous. I thought it was bad in the state Senate because we were okay. fighting around, you know, I was the only woman of color in the state Senate and I was like, oh, it can't get worse than this. And of course, now I go to Congress. And, sure. um, but, <laughs> but I love my job, by the way. I really, really do. I, and I love I, your job, uh, too. <laughs> It is an incredible honor to be there. Um, but the thing is that just because one person or a group of people say climate change isn't real doesn't kinda, make it so. Kind of still real. <laughs> right? It's still true. And you can look at Harvey or Katrina or any of these things that happen in the country and, and say, are you crazy? You're rolling back regulations that require, for example, you to take into account sea level rise when you build infrastructure. Right? That's one of the things that Trump, the Trump administration just did a couple of weeks ago. So what do we do? We organize again. So I've introduced, along with three colleagues in the House, the 100 by 50 bill, 
which is um, addressing, saying we're going to get to 100% renewable energy by 2050. We fight for um, all of science within government, which means fighting back all of the cuts that they're proposing to the CDC, to NASA, to um, NOAA, to all of these places that rely on science in order for us to craft good policy. And then you look at some opportunities that created. Who would have ever thought that the governor of California would actually be speaking for climate change for the entire country? But that's absolutely. what's happening now with Jerry Brown, yeah, um, because states and localities are taking it into their hands to say, no way, we're not going to buy into this. And there's a great New York Times article from like a couple of months ago. It was a front page, long story, that talks about how uh, the Republicans went from being a party that actually did believe in science and, and uh, it's on climate specifically to not and it's all about the money. So we have got to get money out of politics because that's a lot of what's driving us. All right. Thank you for the setup. So you mentioned, you mentioned net neutrality earlier. Um, Keep in mind that Comcast can throttle this when I put this on the internet. Uh, is it dead? It's not dead. It's not dead. I mean, we are in this place. What makes you think that? Because everything, everything goes in waves, right? You, nothing came easily. Nobody fought for um, the right for slaves to be freed, and it happened the next day. No, there you move forward, sure. you move back, and we're in a backwards. Um, we're in a backwards place. Um, I wrote a letter back in June or July to Chairman Pai telling him not to, you know, not to roll back the rules on, um, on, for the FCC. And then I've signed on to Keith Ellison's bill to restore that again. We're continuing to fight legislatively, but this is going to take all of us. And I do think that net neutrality is something that is important in every single congressional district across the country. So part of what I would say on this, but also on other issues that you care about, how many of you know people in states or live in, if you're not from Seattle, if you live in a, in a district, a congressional district, that, is, that has a Republican in it? How many of you Lots. know people, have family members, or live in one of those districts? Everyone should have sure. their hands up. I can't imagine that you don't know somebody, right? So the question is, can you reach out to some of those places where we need to start building engagement and accountability of those legislators back to their districts? Is that something that we can start to think about how you organize a community in some of those places? Because people often say to me, well, you're my congresswoman, and you, you, you basically do all the things I want you to right. do. So what Absolutely. else can I do, right? We're and expecting you something. to do all the work. <laughs> how did he get that? You uh, got that, I know. It's pretty much, pretty much what I know. Um, OK, so um, we, uh, we're, a we're a group of people that depends a lot on data, the, the amount of um, the amount of data usage that we do is, is significant here in this district specifically, right? Um, it's also highly non-secure. And the last election showed us that it might be non-secure in a country wrecking sort of way. Yeah. Uh, got any ideas on how to fix that? Yeah, I mean, we, um, we are working hard on that, but it's tough because this president that we have is um, saying that we didn't even have a Russian hacking of the sure. election. I mean, he hasn't accepted that yet. But the, the big problem we have is that Congress is so slow. You know, our legislative process is very, very slow. And technology moves very quickly. And so we're struggling with everything just to try to catch up, whether it's internet, um, privacy, security, all of these things, nothing has really caught up yet. And um, and so that's, that's a huge issue. I sit on the Judiciary Committee, and so intellectual property is part of that committee. And we're debating even things like FISA warrants and how do you, you know, now everything is online. How do you actually uh, prioritize privacy protection? And then how do you put in place security measures? It's going to require us, first of all, to spend a lot more money at the federal government in really making sure that we are building in those security protections into everything that the federal government does, and then also legislating how you share and trade data. Um, so 
I think also if you look at elections in particular, I hate to say this, but we kind of have to have paper ballots uh, as a backup. We cannot just You can't rely. even say that in this town without, I've I mean, said you know, it, you know this, I mean, is, this is a town that's already moved beyond that point. It, and, and it doesn't look like it wants to go back despite the dangers that we just saw. I think that's something we're just, I think it's gonna now be a conversation again. Yeah. We're never gonna get to a place where you only use paper ballots, sure. that's not what we're talking about. But you have to have a backup system and I think that there's a lot of recognition of that at the federal level okay. um, as well. That's I just cool. think it's gonna be, it, it, we're so slow to actually get any of this moving. And we, we've also proposed um, having a commission around this internet security and hacking and how do we protect our elections and how do we keep them safe for the future. But you can imagine, right, that commission, the 9-11 commission took what, 10, 10 years? 10 years, yeah. So we're talking about 10 years and by then, how much have we moved beyond that? Exactly. So I would just invite people who have ideas about how we address some of these things, you know, quickly and in real time. I would love to hear your thoughts. There's all kinds of groups that are thinking about this in Congress. There's lots of hearings and, you know, other forums, but I'm really open to thinking about what does that look like in a world that's moving so rapidly? How do you feel about first past the post voting? Well, I, I think that there's some really good um, different, you know, for example, ranked voting, sure. which I think is, is actually a really good mechanism for making sure that we... I didn't know the answer to that, by the way. I was not fishing for it. Yeah, and, and so I think that there's... Because, because what that allows you to do is not have it be such a linear process, right? Because... If you, if you, when you're thinking about lots of candidates and you vote for your top candidate, that candidate doesn't get through, it doesn't mean that the next person that gets the most votes would be your candidate. If you right. ranked that person third or fourth, it might move them down the ladder. So that makes a lot of sense to me. Maine has already done that. Yeah. I think we could do some of that work here. We've been really innovative on our voucher system for those of you in Seattle. You know, we just passed that. I hope you all downloaded your vouchers and used them um, because that's really important. $100, everybody gets 100 bucks um, so that you can give it to candidates who qualify and we have public financing, the beginnings of public financing sure. through that. Um, so there's a lot of democratic reforms that we, in D in the big word, democracy reforms. And I'm a vice chair of the Democracy Reform Task Force. Um, and so we're working really hard, not only on overturning Citizens United, but putting in place public financing. And for me as a candidate, I didn't take any corporate PAC money. And my average contribution from 82,000 people across the country who supported my campaign was $23. So we beat Bernie Sanders. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're not the only one to beat Bernie Sanders. That was painful. Sorry, I just that you set me up. I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. That was so painful. <laughs> I, as you all probably know, I was a big Bernie Sanders supporter, the first elected in the state to come out for Bernie, and, and Bernie supported me, one of the earliest candidates that he endorsed, and we've been working very closely together. And I'll just tell you, I think, you know, um, Bernie's not perfect, of course, there, but what he's been advocating for and what he's been pushing for, to me, is part of what we have got to be willing to say, right? And that we have got to be willing to take on corp big corporations that are not paying their fair share. We've got to be willing to take on Wall Street. We've got to be willing to talk about a public system for health care. Um, and so I think that even though he didn't win, he certainly moved the conversation uh, very much in the direction that I believe we need to move. You got approximately four in 10 uh, young Americans, young American voters, I should say, identifying themselves with the Democratic Party. It seems staggeringly low. Um, in the wake of 2016 and everything that's happened since, how does the Democratic Party get back its mojo with the, uh, the young progressive? Well, we got to change who we're putting up for election, and we have to be willing to say some of the things I just said. Um, I, uh, you know, I really, I, got, I think I got 70% of the millennial vote in, sure. in my campaign. 
Um, and it's because I think young people more than anyone else, any other generation really, understand all of the different pieces of what it means to be intersectional, right? Sure. And they care about a whole host of things and they want to see a solution that allows them to thrive and to have a future. They want to have a planet. They don't want to be crowded down with, with college debt. And they want people to take on the powers that are skewing the system to be unequal. So um, I do think that the Democratic Party is moving in that direction. Electing strong progressives sure. like me and others across the country is really important because it allows that conversation to go into the room. And um, I'm really proud to be, I don't think Jessica mentioned this, but first vice chair of the Progressive Caucus. So along with Raul Grijalva and Keith Ellison and Mark Pocan, we are really trying to move the conversation on every level so that it addresses the future of young people, the present and the future of young people, and puts us back in touch with working folks, with young people who are seeing their dreams diminished, um, and, you know, I, I think a lot of that has to do with taking on those big forces out there that a lot of folks believe, and for good reason, um, to have sort of corrupted mm -hmm. politics in general and the Democratic Party as well. Are we still the world's number one superpower? I've never liked the word superpower. No, that's why I'm asking. Like, is it necessary to be that? You know, to me, it's not about being the number one or being the superpower. It's about how you use the power that you have. And that, to me, means we don't bomb places. It means we um, try to prevent war and we protect diplomacy. It means that we invest in people. And I feel like the United States has been increasingly giving up our moral leverage. Sure. I do think we have had a lot of moral leverage, and that's not to say you know, for a nation that was built on slavery and appropriation of Native American rights, it's not like we're perfect, right? But there's always this sense of we're trying to move that moral arc of the universe towards justice and we're putting our hands on it to do that. Um, but we're giving up so much of that increasingly. And, and that is what is really, really troublesome to me. So we should try to be a super power for human rights, for dignity, for respect. Um, I would bet, I don't know this, I would bet that this is the number one energy usage city in America. Um, I would bet that we, we find a way to, uh, to use every bit of energy that we get and throttle the rest down to California through Path 66 as quickly as we can for whatever they'll give us for it, right? Um, so um, we're, I, I heard you say this, this uh, um, what was it, 50? 100 by 50. 100, 100 by 50, great. Now, what do we do now? Well, I think that is part of what we're doing now. Sure. We have to electrify the grid. I mean, we have to make sure that we are producing energy um, at, a, at greater rates than we consume it. And that's not easy, and there's a lot of technologies out there that will help us to get there, but it's not fast. And it means that we are going to have to also move, because at the same time, we want energy, but we want to protect our planet. So Sorry. we're going to have to move to these renewable energy resources, which means an investment by the federal government. I don't know how many people here have a car or use public transit or have an electric vehicle. I have a Volt um, for our family that we use, and it's great, but you know, part of the reason I opted for a Volt and not a leaf, for example, is because the technology for batteries needs to increase so that you have better battery life. And we need to have an infrastructure in place so that you could drive an electric car, and if you run out, that you actually can plug your, your car in. So there's so much that we need to do around solar, around wind energy, but also around making sure that we're transitioning in a way that protects jobs for workers um, at the same time. So, it's not an easy question. We need to make sure that we are um, also monitoring our use of, of energy, you know, our energy consumption. So uh, it's a multi-layered question, and I think that Seattle, I was just in a building, it's actually, um, interestingly, the, 
maybe ironically, the new Weyerhaeuser corporate building in Pioneer <laughs> Square. Um, and interestingly, they created that building, so they're, they're bringing more energy back onto the grid. So they're, they're selling or giving away, I'm not sure which, um, energy onto the grid. And I just thought that was a, a anyway, I won't yeah, get no, into I it. But, you know, I think that's, we need to start thinking about how we really invest in that. So we got a nice razor thin majority, very dramatic uh, gesture by John McCain to raise his, to lower his thumb uh, on the uh, dynamiting of the ACA. Let's not, by the way, forget that there were two Republican uh, female senators. I was just going to say in that. In front of like... that, who did not need quite so dramatic a gesture to. Uh, to uh, make their point. I'm but so whatever. glad you said that because but, it just drives me crazy yeah, and I'm happy, I'm proud, of, you know, I'm, good, I'm a, good for John look, McCain. Look, I'm, I'm a McCain guy, but <laughs> seriously, man, I get it. You need the spotlight. It's all great. Uh, that's a razor thin majority. That's like real close. Uh, so five years from now, not what you hope will happen. What's our government-sponsored health care look like? Look, I think we are closer than we've ever been to actually getting to government-sponsored health care, a, a public um, single-payer single payer system. But it's not going to happen in five years. Okay, I, ten I wish years. I could Pick tell you five years. But I do think in 10 years, it's absolutely a possibility. We have on 676, H.R. 676, John Conyers' mm -hmm. bill, Medicare for All bill, one of the first bills I signed on to when I got to Congress, by the way, um, Bernie Sanders is introducing a Medicare for All bill. Uh, either next week or the week after. And we're going to have more, we already have more sponsors on Conyers' bill than we've had in a long time. It's like 117 or something like that. Um, there are now ways, we have to protect the Affordable Care Act. It, 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 not having the Affordable Care Act would have taken us back multiple steps sure. towards a single payer system. And it has done a lot of good, but the reason it didn't do all the good is because it's still got corporations, insurance companies administering all of that. And so we do need these fixes. And so we are working right now on essentially a bill that would allow states to have a single payer system in the state, but still get the federal dollars to, um, to contribute to that state system. That's one way that we start to move in a direction that gets us there because states like California, Washington, Oregon, there are real possibilities for our states to move in that direction, but without the federal dollars to support that effort, it's not gonna be possible. So we're working on that. There are also things that we can do to start to move towards that in different ways, like the cost of pharmaceutical drugs. Why are we not negotiating the cost of pharmaceutical drugs um, in the same way that we do for the VA? As in an some example. ways, in some ways, that was, if there ever was one, the bright hope of the Trump presidency. Right, is that there was potentially somebody who was willing to go to the table with, uh, with the yeah, it just I know, I know, but but there were promises made, obviously, that that uh, were not followed through on. But the, clearly, the country responded well to the promises. Right, the 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 concept of of going after drug companies, going after insurance companies, going after, uh, and even, I hate to say this, potentially even going after unions, right? All the things that stand in the way for, of, of uh, us getting affordable everything, right? And so, can we get back to that? Can we? Well, um, the, the saddest thing I think, is that people actually believed that sure. that's what he was going to do. Absolutely. And he is betraying people across the country who voted for, them, for him because they desperately needed something, right? They felt, and, they, and their economic situations were in such state that they really felt, and I think they have been, ignored and forgotten in the, because of these big corporations. But can you it, capitalize it, on He's it? nowhere near that. And I just want to, I think we can capitalize on that. I would never put unions in no, the I know. same I'm, category. I'm as, talking about, I agree. Uh, I'm not trying to say, <laughs> hear me out. I'm merely saying that the populist tide against barriers, right, was strong, right? Wherever it went, wherever, wherever the, 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 whether it's regulations that people, like it was clearly break these walls down. 
Well, right? totally. I mean, I think that that is the populist. Um, that is the populist tide. And one of the sad things on Labor Day, you know, we were just sure. at a bunch of Labor Day picnics and events and a worker rights organized, is that a lot of union members voted for Trump. I mean, my right. union friends know that. And um, there's a combination of things that go into that. But the reality is that you had a Democratic Party, um, and, and I miss President Obama so much. I really, really, really do. He's not dead. Um, but, <laughs> in the White House. <laughs> but um, for him to push uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership as his legacy accomplishment mm -hmm. was disastrous for all of us. And um, so I, I think that you know we had Hillary Clinton who was stuck between a president who was pushing for TPP and her husband who pushed for NAFTA without recognizing that nobody's against free trade we're against unfair free trade that benefits corporations over the environment and workers. That's what we're talking about. And we're, we're a global society. I'm an immigrant who came to this country at 16 years old by myself with nothing in my pocket. So if anybody understands what a global society we are, my parents are in India. I don't even live in the same continent as them. And so we understand that you know you can't stop trade any more than you can stop migration. It's not desirable. But what we do need to do is figure out how it's not a race to the bottom, sure. which is what it's been. And so I think that populism is really about making sure that regular folks get to have a job, a home, <laughs> food on the table, send their kids to college, retire with some security. And that is really, really important. And part of the reason for the decay in that has been, in my opinion, just because it's Labor Day, I got to say this, um, has been because of the decline in unionized labor. Sure. I mean, we are, we don't have a powerful representation of collective democracy in the workplace anymore. We rely on a good CEO or a bad CEO. Right, you know, absolutely. We say to a CEO like, okay, well, if you pay good wages, then okay, we don't need a labor union. No, a labor union isn't just about when you have a bad working condition. It's about democracy in the workplace. It's about people having a voice, which is so important in your community. And we need to remind people that maybe the old labor union is not really what we, you know, it, it's not the same anymore, but we need forms of organized labor and democratic collective bargaining. And we need young people to understand how the gains that we got, the fact that we have one of the highest minimum wages in the country tied to the rate of inflation is because of labor unions in this state who fought for that. So sure. go Labor Day. We don't have a lot of time left. Oops, did I go on for too long on that? I figured it was Labor Day, I got to say that. No, it's okay. You're a politician, it's fine. <laughs> He's just getting me back. Fine. He's just getting me back. It's fine. I'll just go back to my street fighter. It's okay. All right, I'm gonna ask you one more question. Yeah. This is, you can decide whether or not you want to answer it or answer whatever other question you'd like to answer instead of this one. 43% of America supports impeaching the sitting president. First off, I don't know that that's ever happened uh, since, at least since Watergate, but 43% seems like a lot. One, do you, and two, does your party? Well, um, I wanna answer that question. I um, have been pushing from the beginning for accountability for a president who has violated the Constitution from day one. Yep. That's what he's done. He's violated the Constitution with Trump Tower, with his financial interests, with his refusing to release his tax returns. Um, he is making millions, tens of millions of dollars just off Secret Service staying in his properties, Mar-a-Lago, and I've introduced two resolutions of inquiry, which are the only tool that the minority has. I'm gonna talk about that in just a second. But here's the thing about impeachment, because I immediately went to find out everything I could about impeachment, <laughs> because if impeachment happens, it goes through the Judiciary Committee. 
and I'm a member of the Judiciary com Committee, so I wanted to know and educate myself on it. And what I have really come to conclude is impeachment is a political test. It's a political test, which means that the process is such that you can introduce articles of impeachment, that's fine, but if the majority is not with you, if you don't have some people from the majority party who support that, it will never go anywhere. So it's a good organizing tool potentially, but what we're missing is in that 43% number, I think it's something like 69%, it just came down from over 70%, I think it's 69% of Republicans are still supporting Trump. What that means is that all those Republican Congress members are not going to go against him. It's a political process, right? So until there is momentum in Republican districts, we can talk impeachment as much as you want, but you're going to introduce articles of impeachment and they're just going to sit there. And they're not going to, um, they're not going to be referred either to the committee or brought up for a floor vote. And just one example of how I just went through this is um, I just introduced a resolution of inquiry into the Judiciary Committee. I'm sorry, I don't know what that is. It's the only, I didn't either, but I've now found out. It's, I've now introduced two of them, and I'm on track for a third. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> and it's the only tool that the minority party has to force at least a hearing on a critical issue. Okay. So you introduce a resolu resolution of inquiry, and it's around a very narrow, Topic. So mine was around the hacking of the election and Donald Trump's, um, my first one was actually, I supported Jerry Nadler's resolution which was around conflicts of interest. The second one was around this. And um, if the majority party doesn't take up the resolution on the floor within 14 days, or sorry, in the committee within 14 days, it goes to the floor for a vote. Interesting. Now it would still get voted down. But, at least but it's because on the record. they don't want to give it yeah. a forum on the floor, they generally take it up in committee. So I introduced it, got taken up in committee, and the Republicans outsourced to a conservative kind of you know white supremacist set of sites um, a counter resolution where they stripped all of my language, and Republicans then introduced language to. Uh, essentially investigate Hillary Clinton and Huma Abedin sure. for their stuff, right? And then they voted that out of committee. So this is what I'm against. Every single Republican voted for that redone resolution of inquiry. That resolution of inquiry now has my name on it, and nice. every Democrat nice. on the committee is on that. And we're not taking our names off of it, we're reintroducing it again and we're essentially saying this is outrageous behavior. So that's what we're up against. So if you want to see impeachment and to see that, see this president held accountable for what he's doing, then we're going to have to continue to build the case so that Republicans start to realize that this man is bad for the Republican Party, he's bad for their individual interests, and he's absolutely destroying our country, and then we'll be able to move out of this presidency. Right. Well, I'm done. <laughs> this has been great. Thank you so much, Mike. Let's give it up for Mike and for Jessica. And thank you to all of you. Really, really appreciated having this opportunity to be with you. Yeah, I want to also thank Ajit George yes. uh, for putting this together and uh, your team as well. Yes, ma'am? Yes, you may. Um, and, uh, but basically, I also want to thank you for coming into this potentially hostile environment. Uh, these guys, you know, they, they tear, tear people up, right? <laughs> you guys are fierce. So, uh, but I really appreciate you being willing to talk to us and uh, I think you may have gotten some people here to be willing to uh, take some actions on their own, which I think that is great. Is. That's great. Thank you all. Anything you want to say? So, yep. So we've got a lot of questions we didn't have time to get to. I'm going to give these to the Congresswoman. Um, she's on Twitter. Her Twitter handle is up there. 
You should, I mean, I think this is a sign people really do want to engage. That's fabulous. So, you yeah. know, I don't know if there's ever going to be another forum in which you can answer them directly to this audience. Maybe we but could do a Reddit forum or something. Yeah, yeah do it. Yeah. Yeah. AMA yeah. this. Please, Ansel. We'll work on that. Yes. Ansel will work on that. We'll get it out to you all. Sounds Wonderful. Good. Thank you all for coming. Thanks. I hope you have a good rest of PACS. Happy Labor Day. Thank you Happy again, Labor. Congresswoman. Thank you again, Mike. <laughs>